Fiona Lloyd Davis. I'm a filmmaker and photojournalist, and I work through my company, Studio Nine Films. Um, I've been asked today to come and talk to you about uh, working in Democratic Republic of Congo with the AF101, which I um, worked with last year several times making a film for Al Jazeera <coughs> English. Um, I just thought I'd introduce um, myself a little bit first. Uh, I've been working in current affairs and documentaries for 20 years. Uh, I started in uh, Bosnia during the war, at the beginning of war in 1992, and have found myself specialising in human rights and uh, sort of areas of conflict really throughout my career, working for BBC and the Correspondent Programme, if any of you remember that, when it was on BBC Two, uh, it was their foreign current affairs strand. Um, uh, a lot of films for Newsnight, um, I made a series of 20 films with the Baghdad blogger, um, dispatches. I've just made a panorama that was on on Monday with Jane Corbin and um, I set up Guardian Films with Maggie O'Kane which is the uh, production arm of the Guardian newspaper and then went back to set up Studio 9 Films. So now I try and do longer, mainly long form documentaries um, and some films for NGOs as well. I've just made a film for Human Rights Watch and doing some work with Redress, a British NGO that helps uh, survivors of torture um, and uh, victims of, of survivors of genocide to um, seek legal redress. Uh, and then from time to time I work direct for the BBC or for other production companies um, on if they're on special projects like a panorama or something like that. So I'll just show you a clip of some of my work just to give you a feel. And just as background, um, I also do photojournalism. So sometimes I do self-shoot um, and other times I have a crew. It just depends on the project, not just the budget, but also the nature of the project. So here's a little clip. So that gives you a taste of the kind of things that I do. And Depending where we are and also what the budget is, sometimes um, it's better to actually be a self-shooter because they're often very sensitive subjects. People are very vulnerable and to have a big crew can often actually not be appropriate for what you're doing. Um, last year, after a long time of trying, I finally got a commission from Al Jazeera English to um, make a film about a really remarkable woman in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Her name's uh, Rebecca Massacre, and she survived uh, four mass rapes herself. Um, and the, I first met her through Human Rights Watch when I was um, making a film for the BBC. Remarkably, it was a film for BBC Three, um, which was about rape in Eastern Congo, simply because despite my attempts, and I think many others, BBC Two, didn't feel able to uh, uh, commission the story. They thought it was too hard, it was too difficult to watch. And uh, despite myself and a number of other production companies and dedicated sort of filmmakers who felt the story should be told, um, it was Danny Cohen, who has great kind of um, foresight in lots of ways, who commissioned this for a young mm -hmm. audience who had you know, probably no idea where the Congo was, let alone what was going on in Eastern Congo. Um, and I'd first come across the story of some background in 2001. Um, after 9-11, um, just about everybody went to Pakistan to try and get into Afghanistan to find Osama bin Laden. And I'd just finished a film for BBC Two correspondent called License to Kill about honour killing in Pakistan. And I couldn't get a visa. So I thought, well, I've I've got to go somewhere, everyone's going somewhere, so I want to go somewhere too. And I rang around and talked to Médecins Sans Frontières and they said, you've got to go to Eastern Congo. There's this completely unreported horror going on in Eastern Congo and you must go there and uh, you know, we'll take you in with us and um, try and tell the story. So I went in with a small group that only recently taken their group of people back into this town called Shabunda um, in the middle of the forest, take a little Cessna um, flying over the, the mountains and the forest for about an hour, get dropped off at the grass dare strip and they come back hopefully and pick you up in a week's time. Um, as I say, the war is sort of raging all around um, and they just sent their small team of three people back in. So I spent sort of uh, four or five days with them and found then, so this is 11 years ago, that 70% of the women in that town had been raped. 
Um, so it was like a, a, an epidemic that nobody was talking about. So I returned to Congo a number of times. I did some news nights. Um, I did the development for Channel 4 Dispatches, which sadly never got made. Um, and then finally got this uh, BBC Three film with Danny um, and uh, took a young Congolese-born British girl back to Congo and we did the film and uh, I met Massacre Rebecca. Um, she has, she's a very extraordinary woman that she set up her own centre to help other women and with virtually no money she's helped over 6,000 women and children and men who've all been raped and rejected by their families which is pretty remarkable in the middle of a sort of pretty small rural community and she's a very engaging dynamic character and it you know it makes very compelling um, TV and compelling films. So Al Jazeera English gave me the commission. If any of you have worked with Al Jazeera, you know that often their witness strands have very small budgets and they're kind of designed for solo filmmakers to go out on their own without a crew and make an observational film in a very sort of intimate way. Um, and after a lot of discussion with them, because it's such a difficult subject, we talked about the way to make it accessible and make it sort of not quite so hard to watch about something that's such a, you know, a, an awful subject. And we decided to make um, the field that the women work in once a week as a kind of character, as a metaphor for them rebuilding their lives, uh, regenerating themselves and sort of regrowth, regrowth. Because Massacre has arranged that once a week all the women that she's helping, which is up to maybe 200 sometimes in the area that she's, she's sort of helping to finance and helping to look after, um, that they all come together once a week and they grow food in the field and so they can come together and talk to each other but they also have a practical purpose of what they're doing. So one of the key concerns about the film was how, how are you going to record this character, this field, in the most beautiful, vivid way because Congo is an extraordinary beautiful country, it's incredibly lush and green and vivid and as a solo operator, me on my own, no crew, it's also a very difficult environment to work in, what are we going to do? So I looked at various options, was I going to take a Z7 and a Canon 5D um, and mix those two together and talking to various people and I ended up talking to VMI, a hire company um, in London who've been fantastic and very supportive of this project they said well there's this new Panasonic coming out the AF 101 and it's tapeless which I'd never shot tapeless before apart, well, apart from with stills and so I went to see them and this this camera had just literally just arrived they'd had it for 10 days it had never been taken on a shoot abroad um, they were still trying to find um, the lenses that would work with it um, and so for my first trip um, I was packed off with a box of Zeiss primes, um, a map box slightly bigger than this um, with some grads and things, and a nano flash uh, because obviously I had to record at 50 megabytes per second, not just 35. I'd already done a test because Al Jazeera are very open to new technology, but you know, kind of thought, well, it's brand new, it's never been tried and tested really. Uh, so I did a test. Um, with a, a pig farm down the road from where I live of feeding the pigs and they seem to, to, to go down very well and so off, off I went. Um, I had to figure out how I was going to use the nano flash because I didn't want, you know, I don't go to the gym as often as I should and it's quite heavy with the Anton Bauer battery strapped on to actually have it on the camera and it makes it again very bulky and you're working again with lots of vulnerable people. You don't want a big camera kind of pushing them with lots of bits and things that pushing sort of in their noses. So my husband, who's a retired army officer, came up with a very good solution, which, um, here you go, sort of DIY uh, camera equipment. It's two ammunition pouches. Oops, mind the microphone. Um, a pair of braces and a Russian army belt that he swapped when he was serving in Sarajevo with a, another Russian uh, UN guy. And actually it's very easy to put on. And I could put the nano flash in one pocket and the Anton Bauer battery in the other. The um, cable from the nano flash can actually go in here quite easily and then you pull it out and try not to forget to plug it in when you're turning over. But as you're also, you know, it's also recording on the 35. So if there was on the cards on board the camera, so if I did sometimes forget, which I'm, I did sometimes, um, 
you've got that as a second, um, as a backup. And, you know, in the great scheme of things, I'm not sure broadcasters can always tell uh, <laughs> whether, they, whether you've been recording it at 35 or 50. Um, so that worked pretty well. I mean, on reflection, I did think um, Congo, it's fine to wear something like this, although I go out of my way to look as non-military as possible because you're surrounded by militias, by soldiers, and you want to be seen to be completely distinct from that. So if I was working um, in the Middle East, for instance, or anywhere where there are American troops, I, I wouldn't wear this because they would assume that it's a suicide belt and they would probably, you know, the American soldiers, I know from experience in working in Iraq with a Baghdad blogger with some packs, um, how aggressive American troops are and, and they will shoot you without asking any questions because simply because they think you could be a threat. So um, just actually being here, there seem to be new alternatives to nano flashes which are much smaller. There's a ninja little box of tricks that seems a fantastic uh, upgrade. I haven't used it yet, so if anyone here has and can, can talk, you know, um, agree whether it works or not, but it uses smaller batteries, um, it has, uh, it, it's much lighter, and so maybe I'll try that on, on the next trip. But So I went off on the first time with the new camera. Um, I'd been given a fantastic briefing by Gerard at VMI, who's a kind of fantastic techie guy. Um, but it was quite daunting because uh, I hadn't used it before, I hadn't worked tapeless before. I was going to be staying in a rural area in a priest's house where they have a generator they turn on for two hours a night. So one had to be, you had to be quite organised about how you were going to transfer your footage, how you're going to recharge your batteries. Um, and that's without the sort of environment which is very hot, it's very, very dusty because there's, uh, none of the roads are paved and so there's dust everywhere. Um, it's quite damp because it rains every night in the sort of tropical um, uh, way that Congo is. Um, and I didn't even know where the field was. So I didn't know if it was going to be flat or on slopes or whatever. So I went off and did a shoot for two or three weeks. Um, and I'll show you a bit, a bit of the footage now so you can uh, see what you think. So that was all done on the first trip. Um, and then I went back in June um, to, for the harvest of the field um, and uh, again was there for two or three weeks. And when I went back the second time, um, they'd actually found a, because I, I had to use just primes on the first trip, which in itself is quite difficult doing observational filming when you've got a very narrow depth of field and everyone's running about and you don't know who's going to do whatever. Um, and they're quite, uh, you know, they're really busy people. So when you ask them if they can do something again or can they slow down, they, you know, mask say, look, I'm too busy to talk, keep talking to you. I've got to, you know, if I don't go and get my crops in, there won't be any food to eat. So, you know, it's, it, was, it was quite tough that first trip just using primes, but on the other hand, it was, um, it was a really, it was really great to have that sort of, uh, the equipment made me in a way slow down and make different decisions, which was really nice. And um, uh, although it was, it was kind of hard, it was, it was a beneficially hard in, actually. Um, and then on the second trip, VMI had found um, an adapter that could work with a zoom. Um, so I took that back and so again in some ways that made life a bit easier but they hadn't actually found the right adapter so there was a sort of vignetting problem because it's so bright there you know even if you've got all your your grads on and you put some NDs on which you can't obviously do if you're running about you, you know it's very bright and then often then you've got to go into a situation like that where it's it's very dark they're dark and you've got a green and blue haze over everything because of the plastic sheeting that they're using to make um, uh, their, their, their shelter. So, um, you know, it was, uh, it was quite a challenge, but I think, you know, all in all, the camera was fantastic. And um, I, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to using again. I'm sort of completely converted, and I find that the non, the, the tapeless way of working is just fantastic because it gives you instant access to your rushes. It gives everybody instant access to the rushes. You know, you can do sync pulls yourself without having to edit it yourself, or, you know, you can edit yourself. You can upload stuff to your client in New York when I did the, the short film for Human Rights Watch, um, although they've got 
an office here in London. The, the, the main client was in New York, so I'd just upload stuff onto Vimeo at night and then they could come back the next day and give me feedback on how they thought the edit was going. So for me it's a kind of complete no-brainer to use, although I'm finding it quite difficult to persuade it's a production company. I've just done a panorama and originally I was going to have to shoot it and I said well we have to use the 101 and they all go oh well we've got a Canon 305 we'd like you to use and it, it's obviously no comparison and for various reasons um, we ended up using a cameraman but they wanted to, to they basically they didn't want to shoot it tapeless because I think it was too new and it was all a bit scary and the idea of not being able to hold your rushes is still resistant and it's the same I think with current affairs and um, and docs inside the BBC as well, but it's still a bit foreign. So, you know, it was great that despite the sort of smallness of the budget in a way, Al Jazeera gives you a huge amount of freedom. You know, once you've battled through the commissioning process, which is quite tough, um, and extracting some money from them, which is even harder, you know, creatively, they're, fan they're fantastic, to, you know, fantastic to work for. So any, any questions? Did you pick up any uh, uh, sound using any of the devices in the camera, i.e. Uh, solid state recording device, separate to the camera? Well, I always take a, uh, I mean, one of the reasons I w didn't want to use a 5D, and, and I haven't gone down that route at all, is as a filmmaker rather than a sort of stills person first, is the idea, you know, you, you'd have to have a separate sound recordist, which if you're shooting somewhere like Congo, which is quite an expensive place to work anyway, you, you know, you've got to take someone else with you. Um, so I always use, you know, a radio mic on my principal character and then a 416 or something like that. And my poor very versatile um, translator fixer, uh, you know, is gradually becoming quite a good boom um, operator or small children um, are quite uh, quite helpful or the driver sometimes, depending on who the driver is, is often roped in. Um, because things like, you know, the, it turned out that, that when I got there and I said to Massacre, so where's the field? You know, and there's this kind of fantastic valley and the, the lots of fields on the sort of low slopes where you could get fantastic shots of them all sort of walking to the thing. And, you know, she said, oh, I'll go and show you. And we walked down the road and then she kind of went, it's up there. It's like, oh, my God, you know, how? I'm going to have to get all the kit up there. And But um, actually, I think it, it was great because you could get fantastic shots of them walking up. Um, they all sort of sat on the slope and you could see it was really physically hard so again with the help of some small children who carried silver boxes up and things like that um, but it was also you know you had to figure out what was the least amount of kit to take out there because you've got to to travel there you go Nairobi Kigali then drive from Kigali to the border then you've often got to walk your stuff across the border so you've got porters who are taking all your boxes across and then you've got to get in the car and then you've got to drive to your location and every day from where you're staying you've got to go somewhere you may have to walk or sometimes go on motorbikes so it's got to be really small and, and contained so that two people really you know can carry the stuff and that you can move around quite lightly because also if something if the situation changes and you want to leave quickly you want to be able to pack up and go without leaving everything behind, which, you know, it's very volatile in Eastern Congo and things can change all the time, so you've got to be aware of that as well. Um, did you take a tripod? I did, yeah. No, I had quite a heavy-duty tripod, which, um, which I needed because even though it's heavy, um, when you're up a vertical slope, you want something really solid that if you want to do a pan or you want to get some nice shots, um, um, you know, when they were uh, harvesting, although I was doing quite a lot handheld, before they did the harvest, in fact, I took a, a 200 mil lens because I wanted to get some of the insects and things that are in the undergrowth to get that sense of growth and, and sort of it's all busy and it's all alive. Um, so, you, you know, I needed a really good tripod. So, yeah, I took a satchel, kind of, I can't remember what model it is, but it's quite a sort of big, chunky one. Um, and as I say, my, my fix is very helpful and um, he carried it quite a lot. So, <laughs> yeah. Did you have anyone else to help with security? No, I mean, <laughs> um, the only place I've ever had um, security, actually I don't think I ever have had security, I'm just trying to think, in Iraq, but I didn't because the kind of stuff that I do, you know, I've, I've not been embedded because I do sort of observational stuff of, of, of everyday life as opposed to, 
Um, I mean, even when I did a film for Correspondent in a favela in Rio, with um, the, there was a, a military policeman who was trying to reform the military police and stop them shooting children and get them to talk to them first, which was a huge sort of change in culture. Um, and we went on a raid with the special forces into um, Complexo Alimau, which I think Prince Harry was taken to and three people were shot in a different part of Complexo Alimau while he was there. So things obviously hadn't changed very much. Um, but even then, you know, I've, I've never had security. And I think, to be honest, and up until January, I'd have said, you know, they're really not needed. And I was in January meant to be doing something for Channel 4 News um, and walked into an armed attack at the hotel where I was staying. Um, now, even if we'd had security, it would have... It would actually probably made things worse. You know, we were very lucky that nobody was killed. Um, they were very aggressive. They were ten armed men who, were after some money, they had there was a million dollars at the hotel in cash, which they never found. Um, so, you know, what can the only time a production that I've worked on has had sort of armed people was I did a, a Channel 4 News feature about 18 months ago with Lindsay Hilsom and we were shooting Kurdistan first and then the director cameraman and Lindsay went to Baghdad to get some for, for a couple of days and we they I didn't go because it wasn't really necessary for all of us to go and they were staying with AKE in an AKE house who's a ex um, SAS <coughs> group um, who provides security and they did have I think four armed guys one um, one foreign, one Brit, and then three or four local Iraqis who are sort of positioned in various areas because it's, you know, the kidnap threat's so high, you've got to be able to get out of the situation quickly, and, um, you know, if they needed to shoot their way out of somewhere, maybe they would there. But certainly the kind of stuff I do, um, it would draw attention to you if you had a security person. Um, having a foreign security person someone like Congo is useless. Like, you know, they'd have to speak the local languages, they'd have to be able to look and listen and know how to interpret local things that are changing. Um, because that's the key somewhere, you know, that's a, a conflict really, or, or a sort of bubbling under kind of conflict like Congo is. But it's a matter of, you know, you might hear something somebody say, something which if you're, even if you understand the language, if you're not local, you wouldn't be able to interpret it in the right way and really understand what it meant, like time to get out of town um, or time to go somewhere safe. So, you know, Jack, who, who I work with in, in Eastern Congo, he's a journalist, he's got an NGO, he's incredibly experienced and he's very well connected. He knows lots of commanders that he can ring and say, your guys are being out of, you know, there's something wrong or ring, what, ask what's going on and find out, you know, what's happening. So I, I you know, trust him with my life, literally. Be, he'd be, he's much more valuable than taking some big bloke, ex-British army bloke, frankly. I mean, they're very good, but, you know, for the right places. Well, so a personal recommendation, you know, um, um, you know, if I'm going somewhere new, um, I haven't worked with bef worked in before, or haven't worked there for a long time, you know, I'd call people who've been there recently. Who did they work with? Who do they recommend? What have their being experiences been? And it's all kind of word of mouth, really, um, is is by far the best that I've I've found. Um, and also talk to NGOs because they can recommend people. They might have. Um, you know, local people that they use to gather intelligence and, and, and research who can speak the languages and, um, again, that they can recommend, that they know they're trustworthy. Because the one thing you don't want, which I think, you know, has happened in Afghanistan quite a lot, is that people just get sold. You know, they, they sell them to the local groups um, and, um, you know, often they don't have any money, so maybe it's just too, too tempting. Oh, very good. Sorry. Mm. Sorry, a technical question. Yeah. You said you had sort of two hours of generator time every night and you were yes. there for two weeks. What did, you, what did you do with all your footage once you had it? Well, I had five. Um, I, was, I was recording on the nano flash with SD cards as well as the onboard camera ones. So I had about five of the bigger cards and, I don't know, four or five of the smaller ones. So I just tried to transfer as much as possible. And then sometimes they did go back during the day and I gave the priests some money for fuel. But the second time I went back, they were having real problems because the, they had a problem with the big generator and they're having difficulty buying fuel because it's also very dirty because it gets kind of watered down or whatever that is that they do with the diesel. Um, so they had a little one, 
which you know was terrible, fluctuating, and it didn't really charge the batteries. So um, it, I just got by. The second trip, it was really. I thought I'll have to take more cards next time. So it's taking enough batteries, enough charges, so that you can actually have four batteries on charge or whatever instead of two, um, and um, you know. Maybe, I mean, if I was going for longer, maybe take some sort of solar power because you could leave that outside during the day and charge something um, and, and just hope that you get everything done. <laughs> Can I just ask how you get on with the airlines? I, I, I've been to Kenya a couple of times. Very difficult to get any sort of concessions. Well, I have to say, Ken, um, Kenya Airways has been fantastic to yeah. me. Uh, they've got a BBC rate, uh, which yeah. is... Yeah four quid a kilo. So um, I said to them that it's, you know, this is a very low budget thing and it's about a very difficult subject and this amazing woman. And so the nice woman, I can't remember her name, but she's extremely helpful and um, has always given me a much cheaper rate. That's a good service. Thank you. Yeah. You need yeah. more than one back out of your person. Yeah, I take, I did two. But in fact, from some of the, one of the um, talks that I sat in on Monday, they suggest three. And I think it, you know, it can depend on your insurance because they can dictate how many copies you need to, um, to be made. But I think, you know, again, it's what's feasible. I don't think I'd have had time, enough electricity to have backed up three times. You know, twice was a bit of a push. So three, having three drives might, you know, it might not have been actually feasible. So again, at least two, but, you know, you might need to go back and to sort of a base and have a third thing and then you could set that going. Um, but then it depends on how many computers, you know, laptops you've got, which I've got one. And the main thing after the end of that trip, I just thought, well, what, what would have I done if something had happened to the laptop, you know, if that got bashed around? Because it's, you know, it's so tough. Um, on one shoot I did with the BBC where we had a cameraman, the, the screws on the Satchelor tripod were actually jolted loose of the tripod and they're falling out because the roads are, are, are so bumpy um, that you know you have to make sh you know, think of the best way to protect you know the drives and the laptop and the camera so that it doesn't get broken because there isn't anywhere um, you yeah, they don't have Apple Mac shops in Goma so and I'm not even sure they do in Kigali so or Ni and they, maybe Nairobi they do I don't know but it's a long way to get you know to get backup stuff so um, you just have to be a bit lucky and, um, you know, prepare, think ahead, you know, as well. And would you send drives yeah. in different bags when you were travelling? Um, yes, I did actually, yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned um, ND filters, the camera got built in? And it has, yeah, it's got four, yeah. But even then it was, um, you know, there was this issue with the vignetting, but apparently they've, they've now got a new adapter <coughs> so that that shouldn't happen anymore. Hopefully, so I haven't used it since the new new adapters come out, but I'm looking hope to at some point. Were there any aspects of the camera you didn't like? Um, well, you know, it was well the the whole vignetting thing was a bit of a pain, but um, hopefully that's been resolved. Um, having to have um, an extra gizmo to record, you know, the footage at the right frame rate for broadcast is again or bit rate. Um, you know, it's a bit of a pain. It's not like just putting a tape in and pressing play. But on the other hand, the quality that you get is, is so much better that, um, that far, for me, I was quite happy to sort of put up with that um, just, just because I felt it was a, a, a different kind of quality from, from, say, a 305 or a Z7 or whatever they, you know, they are. Yeah. Well, I'd sort of tend to go, um, again, for sort of security and also for exhaustion purposes, um, wait till light. So maybe leave the place at about, leave where I was staying about quarter to six or something in the morning and then I'd get there around six. But the thing is they get up at four, so you have to make sure they haven't gone off somewhere and then you don't have any, you can't continue the sequence that you were doing the day before because they've gone up a mountain and they won't be back for hours. So I just try and spend the whole day with them. Um, and, um, you know, they wouldn't, half the time they wouldn't tell you that actually they've got something really interesting in you know, the next five minutes and then they'd dash off and you'd have to sort of run after them. But I try and spend the whole day with them um, unless I went back and were 
to charge stuff or whatever. Or if it's raining, that's the other thing. Because if it rains in the afternoon, they've, if they've got tin roofs, you can't do anything because it's too noisy. You can't do interviews. Um, you can sit and do some observational stuff, but any talking is impossible because you won't be able to use the sound. Is there any problem with the um, spill, sound spill? Yeah, with the location of the generators that go in? Or yeah, you just have to ask them to turn it off. Same thing as anywhere, <laughs> really. Um, yeah, just as normal, just either move or ask people if they can wait or, you know, whatever. I mean, there's always the kind of like noises of people chopping wood or, and often they'll say, you know, they can't stop because if they don't do it, they won't be able to have a fire and then they won't be able to eat. So, you know, you have to be sort of <laughs> sensitive to what you're asking people not to do because it is, you know, it, it's so basic, you know, you, you know, um, you can't ask them not to do things that's actually interfering with their very existence and that's partly what you're you know what you're filming so yeah absolutely so you can go and film the guy's chopping wood and if you want to cut away to that then you've got a, a visual reference to why there's some sort of noise in the on, in the background